Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Dixon from Radiopedia.org, and in this tutorial we're going to learn how to recognize an elbow joint effusion on a lateral radiograph. This is an important clinical skill, particularly in the setting of trauma, where a joint effusion is almost always an indication of an elbow fracture. So we're going to start with a little pretest. Here are six elbows from six different patients, some of which have effusions and some of which do not. Have a look yourself and try and work out where the effusions are. If you're not already, then I recommend watching this video in high resolution as diagnosing an elbow joint effusion requires subtle detection of the elbow fat pads. So let's begin by looking at the elbow fat pads which normally sit adjacent to the distal humerus from which they are separated only by a thin reflection of joint capsule. The anterior fat pad fills the shallow coronoid fossa while the posterior fat pad sits within a much deeper olecranon fossa. Here's a lateral radiograph of a patient who has chronic gout affecting their olecranon bursa, but who does not have an elbow joint effusion. You can see here the normal orientation of the anterior fat pad, which is detectable just in front of and paralleling the distal humerus. It is visible as a darkened area because the fat is considerably lower density than the adjacent musculature. As is normal, the posterior fat pad is not seen as it is hidden within the olecranon fossa. These T1 weighted MRI images in a patient without a joint effusion demonstrate nicely why the posterior fat pad remains hidden by bony structures on a lateral image, while the anterior fat pad sits visible. Here's an example of a normal child's elbow, which also demonstrates the expected appearance of the anterior fat pad and an undetectable posterior fat pad. Let's now have a look at what happens to the fat pads in the presence of a joint effusion, which we have coloured red in this diagram to indicate hemarthrosis. As you can see, the effusion expands the capsular recesses and displaces the fat pads away from the humerus. The anterior fat pad is pushed outwards and upwards, while the posterior fat pad is displaced posteriorly. Here's a patient with a radial neck fracture who has a large elbow joint effusion. You cannot see the joint fluid or blood because it is of similar density to muscle, but what you can see is the displacement of the low density anterior fat pad, which we can draw in here and from which we can imply that there must be an effusion. We can also see the posterior fat pad protrudes behind the posterior margin of the humerus, known as the posterior fat pad sign, implying abnormal distension of the posterior joint recess, which we can draw here. And for further correlation, here is a CT image confirming how the low density fat pads are displaced by an effusion. The triangular appearance of the displaced anterior fat pad has been likened to that of a sail, and for this reason it is often referred to as the sale sign of elbow joint effusion. So let's return now to our six cases and see how many effusions we can find. A, B and D are all adults with joint effusions, each demonstrating sale signs and posterior fat pad signs. B is the patient we have already seen with the radial neck fracture, while A and D have subtle radial head fractures, which are the most common cause of an elbow joint effusion in adults. F is our friend with chronic gout who does not have an elbow joint effusion, while C and E are paediatric patients, with C being the normal example without a joint effusion, and E being a patient with an elbow joint effusion related to a supracondylar fracture, which is the most common cause of an elbow joint effusion in children. So hopefully now you'll be able to confidently identify elbow joint effusions on lateral radiographs by looking for the sale sign and the posterior fat pad sign. You can read more and see other case examples on radiopedia.org.